the steep edge is like actually the downstream side. And here the same thing, the steep edge is the downstream side. So that's how you get the absolute direction of it. Okay, true or false. I've got a picture here. And it's got these marks, these, these uh, striations, all through here. You can see them, they're beautiful. And uh, they're parallel to the scale, so to kind of give you an idea of their size and shape. Um, so, um, is that what these things are? Are these striations? Is that what you call them? First of all, suspect they are not. Well, do they look old like all the other rock surface there? Look pretty fresh, don't they? Yeah, timing doesn't look quite right. That was the first thing that caught my attention. Even though they were nicely lined up, if you'll notice, if you go back to the rock back here, there are a bunch of glacial striations going almost 90 degrees. And if you start looking around a little bit, oh, look at this friction crack here. Ah, and if I do the friction crack thing, it says the ice was moving from right to left. Well, that doesn't fit with those big glacial striations, does it? Hmm. And if I look around a little more, well, all of these indicators, this, this friction crack, these striations back here are all pretty weathered. They look like they've been there for a while. These guys look like they just got made. They look pretty fresh. And if I look around a little more, man, I can find these, these friction cracks all over the place, and they all point in the same direction. So this is telling me, eh, I don't think this is, this is uh, so what do you think it is? Well, <laughs> what? What do I think what is? What do you think these striations, striations, quote unquote, are? Millions of years. Millions of years. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. That's correct. <great. laughs> scratches. Scratches. Where, what do you think these scratches are? What made them? Birds. Could be a demon. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> millions of millions. Of <laughs> yeah, it, it was you. Yeah, it was me. Trick question. No. You it went outside with the picture and was like, search so crazy. No, <laughs> actually, it was my contractor. He shows up during the winter a couple times to check on the cabin. And he comes over on his snowmobile. And it just happened this year that was kind of a bare patch by the back steps. And he spun the tread on his snowmobile that has the little carbide tip uh, things in them, the little knobs. And they were harder than the granite, and they scratched the granite. So it's snowmobile tracks. You guys get a lot of snow up there? Oh, yeah. Do <laughs> you go up there in the winter? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Only once. <laughs> So all of the stuff that's up there, the glacial stuff, is perhaps some of the most spectacular in the area. And you get both pictures, the erosion and the deposition of the glacial glacier. OK, let's get started on deserts. And uh, then uh, we've got two minutes. So deserts are kind of going to the other extreme from water all over the place to just about no water at all. And if we look at it, uh, a desert 
is simply an area that uh, is, is dry. I mean, if you look at the annual precipitation of a desert area, the old uh, definition used to be it got less than uh, 10 centimeters of, of water. The newer definitions have taken it down to two. I don't know why the big change. But needless to say, it gets very, very little water. And when it does get the water, it tends to come kind of all in one or two flash events. So these are areas that see uh, very little rainfall with very uneven distribution of that rainfall. These kind of fall in the category of what we call eolian deposits. And whenever you see the term eolian, you know it's wind-driven or wind-produced uh, deposition. And here you can see a farming area, and the desert is just blowing over this, this farming area and claiming uh, what used to be a productive uh, acreage. And in fact, in this case, you can see a couple of dunes here in this particular shape tells me that they're advancing from right to left and you can see the wind pattern blowing that way. If you go to Africa and look at the south edge of the Sahara Desert, that edge of the desert is advancing 30 miles per year. So this desertification process is serious, it's significant, and it is little by little uh, claiming Africa. Obviously, global warming is probably not helping this process uh, end, is it? It's probably helping to drive the process. Most of portions of Northern Africa used to be lush, verdant, type of uh, topography. And yet desertification, uh, as climate patterns have changed, uh, this has uh, produced a band of desert now that is uh, growing on a yearly basis. Another place where we really <coughs> see this desertification is up in um, uh, well, it's part of uh, Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, um, and it is basically the Ural Sea. And the Ural Sea used to rival the Great Lakes as the largest body of fresh water on Earth. Unfortunately, uh, over the last few decades, the Soviet Union uh, was really pushing agriculture, in particular cotton growing in the area. And the rivers that were feeding the Ural Sea were dammed and the water was uh, withdrawn to irrigate farmland to the point where the Aral Sea wasn't getting recharged. And you can see 1960 it looked like this. By 78, the shoreline, particularly in the southeast, was going. We're getting a few islands started. By 98, it was about half of its size. And by 2010, we've just got these two small <coughs> areas left in the lake. This is a fishing fleet at anchor. Unfortunately, so much of the lake has disappeared that there's no water there. So this whole fishing industry has disappeared. Now they're running out of water, and the cotton agricultural industry is disappearing. And it has become one of the top 10 sites in the world uh, in need of environmental help. And it's getting some, but uh, politics are unbelievable. And trying to tell the farmers that you want the water back, and you know, it's not getting a whole lot of support. So um, is it going to ever recover? It's going to be pretty efficient. Well, when we talked about climate, when we talked about global atmosphere. Remember we talked about the Hadley cells being the two atmospheric cells here uh, between the equator and the 30 degree parallel, and the Farrell cells between the 30 and 60. And where the Hadley and Farrell cells met at the horse latitudes at the 30 degree, you can just kind of see those areas on the map. And look at all the deserts that just perfectly line up with that. 
because that's where that cold, dry air is coming together and sinking to Earth. As it gets closer to Earth and warms up, that dry air, as the temperature increases, can pick up water again. And as it can do that now, that water's coming right out of the Earth. It's just sucking the Earth dry. And all of a sudden now, we've got these big, huge desert areas all kind of lined up where they're in parallels. But you'll notice there are a few other deserts out there that don't match that plan. So um, what's happening there? Well, if we look at the Namib Kalahari, we've got a couple situations there, the low latitude deserts, where we see things kind of being cut off uh, by the cold of the uh, uh, water offshore. And now we see the rainfall coming offshore uh, as that air cools and drops its water. Again, that water now is not available for, uh, for those areas onshore. So we see the <coughs> low latitude deserts. Desertification is expanding like crazy. If you look at it, here's the Sahara. And this is the edge of the Sahara up here by uh, Morocco. And this plume of sediment, of dust and sand that's blowing out of the Sahara, <coughs> trade winds blowing it out into the Atlantic, this is 200 miles long. This is a big, big chunk of area that is seeing the sediments. And I think we looked at this earlier when we looked at the, the atmospheric condition si situation. This ship looks like it's out in the middle of the desert now, but it was originally plying the trade route along the coast when it ran aground. Didn't know that that uncharted sandbar was there because things changed so fast with all this sediment being blown out there. Couldn't get the ship off the sandbar, and since 1912, when it wrecked, it has just been getting sand blown in. The sands continued to grow, and the coastline now has expanded three miles past the ship, which was offshore when it ran aground. So now it's sitting in the desert. Kind of really a weird reminder of uh, how much material is being blown by the wind uh, off of the land and the desert. Another type of effect that we get is what we call orographic lifting. And that's just a fancy way of saying the mountains are causing the air to go up. And we see this in places like the Sonoran Desert in Arizona in this area. And we see it down here in the Patagonia down here in particular. What's happening is the moist air comes off the Pacific and picks up uh, a little moisture out of the ocean, brings it across, and as it starts to hit the Sierra Nevada, the Sierra Nevada range is a high range. And the only thing that air can do is move up the west slope of the Sierra Nevada. And as it does that, it gains altitude. As it gains altitude, it's cooling off, isn't it? And as it cools off, it's going to hit its dew point, and that moisture is going to come out as rain. So by the time the air gets over the Sierra Nevada, it's cold and it's dry. It's dropped all its moisture over here on the west <coughs> flank of the Sierra Nevada. Now as that air, cold air, starts to sink and comes down the east flank of the Sierra, it starts to warm up as it sinks again, and again, can pick up moisture, which it does. And if you look at the eastern side, the leeward side of the Sierra Nevada, it's just the opposite of the windward side, which was all nice and wet. Now, the leeward side is just sucked dry by this cold air warming up, sinking over the area, and pulling the moisture out of the so this orographic lifting effect of the mountains uh, is creating a series of these deserts on the downward flat. And you can see those happening all through here in Great Basin, Sonoran, the Atacama, uh, all of this is 
pretty typical. The mid-latitude deserts, well, those are our 30 degree latitude deserts. And we see one up here that's kind of a little, getting a little off of the 30 degree. Gobi and uh, up there in the uh, Turkestan area. And what we see there is this desert is just so far away from any water. It's kind of out in the middle of this continent, middle of nowhere, that by the time the air gets there, it's had so many different opportunities to drop the moisture that it contains, but there just isn't enough moisture left to get there. So we have a couple of these places on Earth, primarily here in uh, this part of the middle of Eurasia, where it just doesn't win anything. And we have polar deserts. You, know, you may not have thought about this, but the Antarctica area is a desert. The air is cold. Cold air doesn't hold much moisture. And without moisture, there is no snow. And without much snow, uh, without much moisture, you're below the limits for being classified a desert. So even though snow is there, it's cold, it lasts a long time, it accumulates over time, but you don't get much on a yearly basis. So it actually classifies as a desert area. Who would have thought? Okay, this is probably a good spot to, to stop for today and we'll switch over and do a couple of extra credit tricks.